a good time to switch. This is a good time to switch to speaker view. <clears throat> to open the program today, David Diskin has a musical offering. Okay, I'm going to try to share my screen. Okay. Hopefully you're all seeing this. Um, so we thought today we'd deviate a little bit um, as we are all thinking of the Ukrainian people and the, the few Jews that are left. It was once the largest Jewish community <clears throat> uh, probably in the world, well, in Europe anyway. Um, and this song, which is actually using words by Rabbi Nachman of Bratislav, who was born in the Ukraine, buried in Uman, where you know bombs have been falling and where Orthodox or others pilgrimage to his his uh, grave. <clears throat> anyway, Kol HaOlam Kulo Gesher Tzamaod. The uh, whole entire world is a very narrow bridge, but the main thing is to have no fear. And um, actually the original words by Rabbi Nachman is, know that a person needs to cross a very narrow bridge and what is essential is not to be afraid. And uh, the Ukrainian people and Zelensky in particular, certainly demonstrating that. So we thought we'd play a version of this song now. I'm, I'm gonna stop the share and reshare. <clears throat> Which many of you may already be familiar with, but let's see. Okay. Where did it go? Okay. And let me know if you can hear this and see it. If you can't, you know, shake your head. Thank you, David. You're quite welcome. And now some logistics and reminders about our Zoom protocol. At the end of De Deborah's presentation, we'll have a question and answer period led by Su Sid Booth, our moderator. Please post your questions on the chat during the talk addressed to everyone. 
so Sid can include your queries. At around one o'clock, Harriet will take over. She will read questions Deborah has suggested to spark our conversations in the breakout rooms. At around 1.25, we will regroup for brief concluding remarks. Please stay muted until we go to the breakout room so we don't interrupt the speaker. It's up to you whether you want to be seen, but I encourage you to leave your video on. Finally, to prevent feedback, please do not use more than one device signed into Lunch and Learn in the same room. Deborah Winter joined the staff of Temple Micah in the summer of 2019, settling in DC after a decade spent traveling the US as a freelance musician in the Jewish community. In recent years, she has served as a faculty member at several conferences dedicated to the teaching of Jewish musical leadership skills nationwide, including NIFTI's Nashir Conference, Lift Every Voice, and the URJ's premier program, Hava Nashira. In December of 2019, Deborah traveled to Chicago to serve as the Associate Music Director of the URJ Biennial Conference and has served as a featured musical leader at the annual international gatherings of youth organizations, BBYO, NIFTI, and USY. Deborah studied music theory and education in undergraduate school, culminating with a recital program entitled Of Love and Loss, Of Light and Life an evening of classical music by Jewish composers. This program and its accompanying research form the basis of this Lunch and Learn talk. Jewish music itself has a fascinating history, but perhaps more fascinating still are the Jewish backgrounds of several well-known secular composers, from Mendelssohn, Mahler, and Schoenberg to Copland, Bernstein, and Sondheim. We will explore both the Jewish and musical histories and hear a few of their beautiful compositions along the way. This program will be accompanied by Dr. Do Joshua Fishbein on the piano. With a last reminder to keep, to post your questions to the chat and to keep you muted, I'm delighted to turn the program over to Deborah Winter. Hello, everyone. It's good to see you all. I see that I'm on spotlight, but I'm going to put you on gallery view because I would love to see all of your faces um, as we move through this program. I learned after Yom Kippur afternoon that the Wi-Fi connection in the sanctuary might not be the greatest Wi-Fi connection in the building. Uh, so if there is something that you struggle to hear, I hope it will come back in the, in the questions that we get later. Um, I also hope that you can hear me well. You can give me a thumbs up or nod. Uh, we did a little bit of moving around of a microphone to make sure that everything is captured, uh, but I, I hope that everyone can yes hear uh, and see. And uh, Dr. Joshua Fishbein on the piano um, is wonderful and will be accompanying through this program. Uh, I wanted to kind of resurrect some of this research I did in undergrad uh, in college about uh, the Jewish history within our classical music composers. Um, and I found it really interesting. And what I didn't as much realize is how out of shape my voice is to sing the same things I did 10, 12 years ago. So uh, you'll bear with me. We did just do some rehearsing, so we're a little tired, but I think that we will um, we'll get through this just fine. So I'm, uh, I'm gonna move chronologically through some history, <clears throat> leaving many gaps. Uh, because we're starting in, in, the, uh, in 1570, so I think that we uh, should need to speed through if we're gonna get through it in one lunch and learn. Uh, but I, I will actually start by uh, mentioning uh, someone you may have heard of that uh, I think I heard in the preamble to this program, we were talking about the choral program that we had to unfortunately let go of when Omicron started raging, but uh, Salomone de Rossi um, is an early pioneer and also an outlier um, in the history of what we might call Jewish music, um, which we'll get into that terminology in a, in a moment. But in Renaissance Italy, um, the, a, as you'll know, the Jewish history is uh, punctuated by intermittent tolerance of Jews in modern secular societies throughout the world and throughout history. Um, Renaissance Italy was itself intermittently tolerant um, of Jews, of Jewish leadership, of Jewish uh, practices and presence and peoplehood. So 
Um, as a practicing Jew, Rossi was able to achieve prominence in, in the courts, um, in the Gonzaga court uh, particularly, uh, and so he was able to bring his full Jewish identity into his work. Some of the composers that we'll mention later um, converted out of Judaism for, uh, for reasons of professional opportunity and achievement, um, but we'll get into that in a moment. So uh, in Renaissance Italy, Rossi uh, composed some works for the court, um, actually on behalf of the court also some Jewish work, some Hebrew, uh, uh, some liturgical settings. Um, Josh actually brought one of them uh, to my attention for today that would be nice to, uh, to, to learn. So I see actually, I think my grandfather is here and I think my mom is here and they were at my recital, but this one was not in my recital. We did an Italian piece uh, by Rossi in my recital, but we'll do this. Um, his setting of Baruch Hu, uh, from his uh, from his collected work called Hashiri Masher L'Shlomo, um, which translates to the Songs of Solomon, but has nothing to do with the Hebrew text Songs of Solomon, and is instead thought to be a pun on his own name, Salomone de Rossi. Um, so these Songs of Solomon uh, are, are choral works for the synagogue, which itself was a bit of uh, antithetical to, to choral work in the synagogue was not something that was allowed until um, a responsa uh, by Rabbi Leon Medina in, in 1605, um, who struck up a friendship with Rossi and provided halachic Jewish legal backing for the singing of choral works in the synagogue. So we can thank him for our Temple Micah Choir. Um, and this was uh, our first foray into kind of secularizing the music that we were doing. Um, we'll get into some questions of what makes music Jewish <laughs> later on, um, but this was performative choral music. This piece is for three voices. We will have two of them. Josh will sing along with me, uh, but you'll hear all three in the piano. This is Baruch Hu by Solomone Rossi. <laughs> This text is familiar to us, but this particular way of setting it, not so much. Um, early Renaissance polyphony, multiple melodies that fit together. Uh, a beautiful setting of Baruch Hu, some text painting with the word Adonai being sung all together, with the words Le'olam Va'ed forever and ever being repeated several times. Um, an early choral work that I wish we had more time to talk about, but we need to move on. So. Uh, 200 years almost separate this outlier, this, uh, this Rossi uh, composer and his works from the next uh, uh, composers that we'll study in the program. Uh, we are studying, uh, well, we'll sing a, a bit of a piece by Felix Mendelssohn and also by his sister Fanny Mendelssohn Hensel, uh, both of whom were grandchildren of famous Jewish philosopher Moses Mendelssohn. Um, who is considered the father of Jewish enlightenment, who uh, valued reasoned arguments 
to religious truth, thought that we could uh, and should use our, our logical, more secularized thought processes to arrive at the same conclusions about our religion and our faith. Um, so uh, he argued passionately about the coexistence of secular culture and his Orthodox Jewish community. Um, but as you may know, the late 18th century Germany uh, might not have provided many uh, opportunities for professional growth for those practicing Judaism. So um, Moses Mendelssohn's own children, while they retained uh, elements of their Jewish practice, all eventually, well, four of six, I think, eventually converted out of Judaism, including Felix and Fanny's father, Abraham Mendelssohn Bartholdi. He added a, a last name um, at the same time that he baptized his children, Felix and Fanny, each uh, being baptized into uh, Christianity at around the age of seven. Um, and in adding this last name, uh, he wrote in a letter to his son at some point that there can no more be a Christian Mendelssohn then there can be a Jewish Confucius. So adding that last name was uh, was part of the separation of keeping the tradition with his uh, father, with Moses Mendelssohn and his works, um, and becoming Mendelssohn Bartholdi in this in this new iteration of the family. Um, so the text actually for both of these German poems comes from a, a I would say a Jewish poet, a poet who also, in order to achieve his prominence, later converted out of Judaism. Um, Heinrich Heine uh, was the poet who uh, composed the, the poetry that became both of these pieces of music, um, both in German, uh, and I guess I should probably read a translation because you don't have them in front of you. So uh, from this program, from my re voice recital uh, ages ago, I will be reading <laughs> the translation of these two pieces, these two German pieces uh, by Mendelssohn on Wings of Song, uh, My Beloved, I Carry You Forth. The, the violets giggle and cuddle. These are, I'm skipping through a few lines. Um, there, we will lie down under the palm tree and savor love and peace and dream a blissful dream. This is, this first poem, very uh, loving and, and happy and hopeful. And on the other hand, his sister's poem entitled Verlust or Loss. If the flowers knew how deeply wounded is my heart, they would weep with me to heal my pain. Uh, they would happily ring out, a, uh, if the nightingales knew how sad and sick I am, they would happily ring out a refreshing song. Um, they all cannot know, only one knows my pain. He has indeed himself torn apart my heart. So very different uh, takes on love, both in German poetry by uh, the same poet who became friends with both siblings uh, in, their, in their childhood as in Berlin. Um, great, so, so Mendelssohn and Hensel, these two pieces of lovely music. A flieg in den Diskisonis, mit Liebchen tracht ich dich fort. Fort nach dir für den Diskonis, dort weich ich den schönsten Ort. Dort liegt ein Rotbühne. 
So I hope you can hear in both of those pieces how uh, light and airy and major one was and how uh, kind of yearning and, and weeping the other is uh, based on the text painting of this poetry uh, from their childhood friend. Okay. Uh, this is the most difficult piece that I have and, and, and we'll do it anyway uh, because it's also Josh's favorite. So uh, Mahler was mentioned also in, in the write-up of this program. Gustav Mahler, who uh, was born in 1860 and then also later converted out of Judaism uh, at the age of 37, um, probably due to a ban on a particular job that he ended up getting shortly after he converted as the director of the Vienna Court Opera. Um, it, uh, interesting uh, logic of the time, certainly, but, uh, but there was a, a ban on, on Jews being appointed to that position, and shortly after his conversion, that is, that is where he rose to prominence. Um, at, at some point, uh, a close friend of Mahler suggested that he write a mass, write a full mass to, to show that his conversion was heartfelt, was genuine. Um, and Mahler himself responded that he could never write the credo section of the Mass, the one that affirms belief in Jesus Christ. Uh, and so he, he maintained a, a Jewish identity uh, throughout his life, but he once wrote to describe himself uh, that he was three times homeless, a Bohemian in Austria, an Austrian among Germans, and a Jew throughout the world, everywhere an intruder, never welcomed. Uh, that may have shown itself in some of his works. Uh, this piece is entitled Erinnerung or Memory. Um, again, a bit of translation. Uh, my memory awakens the songs again and again. I hope mine does the same. Uh, my songs awaken love ever again. And uh, it's, it's a love song. The song awakens love. Love awakens the songs. Uh, it's a love song about love and also about music. I'm going to drink a bit because this, again, is a very difficult piece, but then we'll have uh, some beautiful Mahler. Thank you. 
you, Josh, for bearing with me. Uh, we mentioned Schoenberg also at the, uh, in the brief for this program. Uh, even more difficult music he wrote, uh, he was pioneering a, a, what he called a 12-tone system, um, where uh, in most Western music, harmony is determined by a key uh, that does not have all 12 notes in it. Um, and Schoenberg wrote very interesting melodies and harmonies that use the entirety of, of the, this uh, iteration of, of musical notes, this set of 12 chromatic notes. Um, Mahler also wrote very difficult music, so uh, uh, it's all beautiful, um, and I'm glad that we were able to, to sing that piece. Um, a few more, I'm not sure, I think I'm probably going over time a little bit, um, and uh, we can uh, feel free to stop me if we, if we need, but if you'll bear with me, I think maybe a bit of a longer program and a shorter Q&A would get us to, uh, to the same time for the lunch quote unquote, part of Lunch and Learn that I hope that we can bring back soon in, in real life. <clears throat> uh, I wanted to do these, these next four pieces kind of as a block, uh, which is ironic because the first one is by Bloch. Uh, Ernest Bloch, 1880 to 1959, um, a citizen of the world born in Geneva, studied in Brussels, Germany, Paris, uh, eventually settled here in the States. Um, he wrote the, the sacred service that many of you who were in the choir were uh, able to perform a number of years ago. I'm not sure exactly the number of years. Uh, I see Teddy is here. Teddy certainly knows um, of the, the sacred service by Ernest Bloch. Uh, this is a, a French translation of Psalm 114. Um, and uh, Josh has heroically uh, learned a, an orchestral reduction of, uh, he's got his work cut out for him in this piece. Um, but I, I wanted to, uh, to mention a bit about Bloch and his relationship with Judaism. He had a very strong relationship with Judaism and a less strong relationship with uh, organized Jewish community, um, which is something that I can identify with as it is often said that if you like organized Jewish community, don't come here. Uh, but we, uh, we love our Jewish community even when it is disorganized. Um, he was a little... Uh, he, he, he had this to say, I'll say, about, about Judaism he, or about organized congregational life. He said, I have for a long time wished to go to the synagogue, um, but the recollection of those fellow Jews who on Yom Kippur read the Tribune, uh, something I still remember from the age of 10, remains with me still. It seems as though that sort of thing hasn't changed, uh, or in his communities it hadn't. I would really like to take part in the community, he put that in quotes, but I'm afraid of finding everything except the Jewish spirit, which I am looking for. Um, so we are striving to create the kind of community here that Ernest Bloch himself would have wanted to attend. Um, and I, I, I think we do a pretty good job. Uh, but this, uh, this setting of Psalm 114, uh, translated into French, uh, I think we'll do this separately and then talk about the other composers from the 20th century that we have to work with today. <clears throat>
Thank you, Josh. I hope you could see. I hope uh, we'll give big uh, rounds of applause for Josh on that one. That was a beautiful reduction of a full orchestra. Uh, a few more pieces. Uh, the next one, more familiar, um, a setting of Psalm 23 from the Chichester Psalms uh, by Leonard Bernstein. We have sung this at, at Yom Kippur um, since I've been here, and I think for many years pre uh, when I got here. Uh, but I, I did it at my senior voice recital, and it felt wrong not to do it uh, in translating that to Temple Micah. So um, I uh, will read uh, actually a bit about Leonard Bernstein um, before we do that, and uh, about each of the next composers. I think to save time, we'll go from one to the other um, for the next few. Um, so Leonard Bernstein first. Um, it was in his childhood synagogue, uh, Mishkan Tefila of Roxbury, Massachusetts, that Leonard Bernstein had his earliest memory of music, uh, saying later of this moment that he felt something stir within him, quote, as if I were becoming subconsciously aware of music as my raison d'etre. Uh, his first surviving completed piece was a setting of Psalm 148. Um, and throughout his life, he continued to write works on both secular and Jewish themes. While not traditionally observant himself, he was deeply Jewish in many ways. Um, and was eventually awarded an honorary rabbinic degree from Hebrew Union College, uh, which is a, a fun fact I learned uh, in researching this recital. Um, again, this Psalm 23 that we'll sing in just a moment is from Chichester Psalms, which I would love to talk about, but actually Josh would be your expert on, on that piece, uh, as it was your dissertation, mm -hmm. uh, was about uh, that work. Um, so if you have questions about that work I, later on, I actually might direct you uh, to Josh, who is our, our resident expert, certainly on that piece. Um, but following Bernstein, we'll sing Copeland. <clears throat> Aaron Copeland, uh, while Jewish throughout his life, lived fully assimilated into secular American culture. Um, he learned enough Hebrew to get him through his bar mitzvah, but did not go much further in embracing his Judaism, or at least the Hebrew content of it. Um, the piece chosen for this recital was one which broke this mold. Um, it's a setting of a well-known poem about Israel originally written in Hebrew by Yehuda HaLevi. Uh, and was composed during a period of time in which Copeland decided to rediscover his Jewish roots. Um, I'm not sure, I wrote here uh, many years ago, I'm not sure he ever quite got there in rediscovering his Jewish roots. However, because Leonard Bernstein is quoted as having said to him, Aaron, you're not a real Jew. Uh, so that's uh, a fun fact for the ages from, from the history of these two composers who were contemporaries. Uh, and after this, we'll hear from Kurt Weil. Um, Kurt Weil was a son of a cantor born in Germany um, who started composing at the age of 12. His first surviving piece is a setting of Mia Deer, a Hebrew text sung at Jewish weddings, and his first of substance was a song cycle on poems by Yehuda Halavi, again, the Spanish Hebrew poet. In his life as a composer, he used his music and his name to promote his leftist social values. Um, when he fled Nazi Germany and settled in New York in 1935, he spent many years encouraging the United States to take an active or a more active role in World War II with his works We Will Never Die in 1943 and A Flag is Born in 1946. Uh, though he stopped practicing the rituals of Judaism in his adult life, he never abandoned his Jewish roots and many of his surviving liturgical works are considered masterpieces by the Jewish community, many of which were commissioned uh, by Park Avenue Synagogue in the, in the 1950s um, and are some of Josh's favorite Jewish pieces of music. But the one we have for today is actually a French tango. Uh, so we'll get to that after Bernstein, Copeland, and Weil, uh, and then we'll wrap up with some Sondheim uh, shortly after that, which it just felt wrong not to sing. So we're nearing the end, but we're going to do these last few pieces of music, and thank you uh, for being here with me throughout this program.
we should skip, but I don't want to. We'll do it fast. Uh, the vial, uh, a French tango about a Deborah, take your time. Okay, take thank you, time. David. Uh, a dream of a faraway land in French, you call it Kurt Vial. C'est presque au bout du monde. time um, just to close it out on a lighter note and also a heavier note uh, Stephen Sondheim um, born Jewish lived secularly uh, at the time of this recital he was the only living composer um, and of course he, he passed away only recently um, so it felt wrong not to, to sing a little tribute to him um, and there are actually there were after his death recently several articles written about um, maybe his relationship with Judaism as told through his works, uh, something he didn't speak publicly about, but uh, people noticed a kind of a Jewish sensibility um, in his writing. Uh, and one of them has the subtitle I just want to read before we quickly sing, uh, from Evening Primrose, this piece, Take Me to the World, um, that Sondheim's work is elusive, ambivalent, internally conflicted, and deeply concerned with how stories are told. What could be more Jewish? Stephen Sondheim, Take Me to the World.
To, to hear what was going on here. I heard there may have been some problems, or I read there may have been some problems. Uh, I, I hope that our, a conversation that stems from this, uh, it, uh, there were some touch points of what, what makes music Jewish. Um, and, and we've also had, uh, in, in many ways, and with many of you on the screen, conversations of what makes music prayer. Um, those are some of the conversations these composers themselves were having. Uh, so uh, thank you for, for sitting with us for that. I, I hope that we have some time uh, if there were questions. I know that this is not as long as people usually go in this format, but I, I appreciate uh, you bearing with me for this resurrection of, of this music that I was thrilled to pull out of this binder. So thank you. Deborah, people must have heard <clears throat> well enough because there's been a lot of requests for an encore if you have anything <laughs> you would like to do. <clears throat> Feel free. I could have saved some time. If not, we can go into rehearse last week that we did that didn't make it into the program. I gave you all the music back, so you gave me all the music back. Uh, we have some. Uh, there was certainly more uh, that I. Sorry, I'll stand near the microphone. There was certainly more in the original recital, um, but I haven't necessarily rehearsed it with. Josh, and it's not the easiest. So if we can dig up something, we'll, we'll try to do that. But uh, definitely a, a different class of music than, than we're used to singing in this space together. Yeah, well, it was wonderful. So maybe should we go into Q&A then? Or do you have something you want to, you do want to sing? Oh, yeah. If you're asking me, we can certainly go, go into Q&A. Thank you. OK. OK. So um, Sid? Um, you can unmute yourself and I have and uh, th take thank over. You. Thank you, Deborah. Um, there are dozens of comments and questions here, and I hope the chat can be re preserved so that you can go over them at your leisure. Uh, off the bat, David asks, uh, how hard is it for you to sing in another language, especially one you may not know or not know very well? And uh, which piece is the hardest for you to sing? Um, yeah, I, uh, so in studying voice, uh, you study diction in different languages, uh, the particular ways that different languages shape vowels in their mouths and consonants. Uh, that's, uh, you mostly learn to pronounce the words appropriately, and then you learn later what they mean. Uh, and so that uh, that was the approach. I, I personally take to languages pretty well, uh, so that was something that I, I found fun, uh, but many of my classmates were, were not as into the idea of French diction um, as I might have been. There is uh, an international phonetic alphabet uh, that for, for the nerds who really liked the language, sometimes we would write notes to each other in, uh, but uh, it helps to, to shape particular vowels, uh, that French has their own unique vowels, and actually in, uh, in not an American accent, some Hebrew vowels resemble French vowels. Uh, so it's, it's interesting to learn about these uh, connections to how different uh, cultures and languages shape their words. Um, and the other part of the question, Sid, if you would remind me, I'm sorry, it, it ha I've lost it. <laughs> uh, sure. Um, <sighs> oh, it was about uh, the difficulty of the music. Yes. 
Thank you, Sid. Uh, so the, the music, uh, I found the Mahler piece that we did today the most difficult uh, today harmonically uh, to learn. Not all of the notes that I was singing are in the piano part harmonically or melodically. Um, in the original recital, the Schoenberg piece that I mentioned, the 12-tone the harmonies that my ears and uh, are just not used to hearing uh, was the hardest to learn. Um, the hardest for me to sing in 2022 um, probably is anything with a high A in it, which was a few of these. Uh, and one that we ended up cutting from the program for that reason, because the approach to the note was not something that my voice could still do. So two different answers to both halves of your question. Uh, Laura Ferguson asks, or she doesn't, she comments, bravo, Josh, for that orchestral accompaniment. Uh, Jennifer asks, uh, or says, blocks Psalm 114, so modern, dramatic. Was this intended for concert or prayer service? That's a, a, a great question. Uh, Bloch, uh, who didn't love the synagogue, um, probably did not write it for a prayer service. Um, but I would love to have a longer conversation on if it would be appropriate in what is considered a prayer service. What is it about the music in our services that enables prayer? And is that style of drama uh, and music part of that conversation? Um, I, I find that conversation fascinating, and so did many of these composers themselves. It's, uh, Bloch did not write with the Hebrew Psalms uh, because he didn't consider his Hebrew skills up to scratch, but was very inspired by these French translations of them. Uh, so he wrote it as part of a, a, a small or maybe large, we're finding conflicting information cycle, of, a Jewish cycle of, of music um, that was intended for performance, and he wrote a sacred service. Uh, so, so whatever that means, uh, it's an ongoing conversation in terms of how it can be prayerful, what it means for people to pray together in song, um, and how the song itself informs that. From no answer, a, but I'm happy to continue the conversation. From Barbara Diskin, does music surpass religious belief how do you feel about singing beautiful Christian music? Um, obviously, there are some outstanding Jewish composers. Yeah, um, music, as we've discussed and uh, mentioned in this program, enables prayer. It also can be separate from it. Um, I mentioned Mahler's uh, inability to write a credo, a belief, a, an emphasis of a belief in, in Jesus Christ. Um, I, like all of us, grew up singing uh, Christian religious music. Uh, it's, it's where the, the, the financial backing was for composers for many years. Uh, it's, it's the catalog of music that we have uh, that my high school did uh, and, and uh, it's something that I've done for many years, and it's uh, you can appreciate the music for the music. Um, probably someone with a strong Christian belief would appreciate it more also for the text and the text painting and maybe some of the, the meaning behind the composition. Um, I don't have a problem singing any music. Uh, I would appreciate it for different reasons. Um, and I appreciate our music, which is not anything like this music that we sing in this space together a lot of the time um, for, for several reasons, music itself being a, a small part of it sometimes because I have that deeper connection to our, our Jewish texts. Karen Rosenbaum, how, I'd like to hear more about Chichester uh, Psalms, a lovely work. Josh, would you like to speak sure. for a minute on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll chime in. Sure. Um, so yeah, the Chichester Psalms were commissioned by Chichester Cathedral. That's where the name comes from, Chichester Cathedral in England. The dean of Chichester Cathedral was named Dean Walter Hussey, and he commissioned many pieces of the repertoire, um, including music by Benjamin Britten. And I think it's interesting that um, you guys do it here at Temple Micah, being in the shadow of the National Cathedral right, right, right around the corner. Um, it's possibly one of Bernstein's most performed choral pieces. 
for certain, and it was composed with a strange orchestration. Um, the orchestra that he composed for had no woodwinds. Uh, it had five percussion plus timpani, which is a large percussion section, but not out of the question, and two harp parts, which today, you know, harpists are like gold, so that the fact that he wrote for two, two harpists uh, meant that he, fe he really felt strongly about it. He, he could do what, what, whatever he, he wanted, though, because he was Leonard Bernstein. Um, in the score, he says that it should be sung by um, men and boys only, which was the tradition in England, the, men and, the tradition of the, of the men and boy choir in England. Uh, but many uh, females have, have sung the, the treble solo, and it's certainly been performed many, many times by uh, female and male voices together. Josh, we, we don't usually traffic in rumors in this venue, but um, you have a chance to address this immediately. Rumor has it, says Barbara Diskin, that you did your, dis your doctoral dissertation on the Psalms, on the, excuse me, on the Psalms. True or not? That, it's, not, it's, not it's not a rumor. I think Deborah mentioned it earlier in the, uh, in the recital. Yeah, I composed a, um, I did an analysis of that. I, I got my PhD at UCLA, uh, where actually Arnold Schoenberg, who didn't make it into the program, he taught at UCLA, and the music building is named the Arnold Schoenberg Music Building. Um, and I composed a companion to the Chichester Psalms that has the same instrumentation that I just mentioned, without woodwinds and all the percussion and, and two harps um, that was designed to be performed on the same program, which, which it was. Uh, the Chichester Psalms is, is about 19 minutes, or maybe a little more, 19 and a half minutes total. So it's not long enough to fill out an entire program. And my reasoning was, if it, hey, if you're going to get this weird orchestra together to perform the piece, and it's performed a lot, you need something to go with it. And what should go with it? Well, I'll, I'll compose something. And, and, and I did, and, and it was performed along with it. Um, but I didn't make a reduct. I didn't do a, um, Bernstein arranged his for harp and organ and percussion. He has smaller versions, which I have not done yet. Maybe if I do that, it'll be performed more often. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, Ginger Fromm, uh, I've always thought that a difference between Jewish music and Christian music is there is more in minor keys in Jewish music. True? I don't know. Um, I uh, is the short answer. I'd have to do a, a more thorough uh, study of, of all Jewish and all Christian music. Uh, I think what it, what is maybe considered traditional sounding Jewish music uh, uses a minor modality or sometimes a what we'll call a, a fragish modality, which sounds kind of minor. <laughs> he was ready to do that knowing what I was about to say uh, so uh, that does sound kind of minor um, in, in more traditional settings certainly in modern uh, compositions people are, are using modern sensibilities um, and I, I say that to encompass modern starting all the way with Rossi and what he considered my modern uh, so uh, it probably is true, but I don't know that I could say that without a kind of a thorough uh, study. Uh, Gene Nordhaus points out that there'll be a re-airing on PBS of a 2013 film on great performances entitled Broadway Musicals, A Jewish Legacy. If you have not seen that, uh, I would say to the, everybody in the audience, it's a must see. Um, can you, Jan Gordon asks if you can share a little more background on the Weil piece. Uh, sure, on this particular piece. Um, and a translation. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh sure. Um, yeah, I, I, I went pretty quickly there, Jan. Thank you for, for bringing that back up. Um, the, the piece is, uh, it's about a, a far off land uh, that I think is invented um, by the, the poet or the lyricist uh, in, in this particular uh, setting. 
um, called Yukali, uh, and it tells the story of arriving to that land and the, the beauty of that land, and it ends with, but it is only a dream, it's not real, uh, and, and it got kind of um, uh, more, more melancholy toward the end there about this, this wonderful place of Yukali that, that is not uh, quite tangible uh, to us. Uh, the piece itself I, uh, I brought uh, to our first rehearsal last week, and Josh said I didn't know Vile wrote a tango, because uh, he was in, uh, in other styles mostly, uh, but this is, this is a piece I carried with me. Uh, this was one of the, the few, uh, maybe the only piece that I walked into the, this voice department already knowing, um, and it's been with me a long time. I, I love that particular uh, piece of music. Um, so it made it in, even though Kurt Vile, uh, which piece of his, the Kaddish, that is a, the one that you most uh, uh, yeah, Kurt Vile's Kaddish, that's right. Yeah, he has uh, some oh, no, Kiddish, excuse me. Oh, Kiddish. The, the blessing over the wine, the Kiddish. Very different. Uh, <laughs> uh, which was commissioned by Park Avenue Synagogue in a very different style. Um, we thought about bringing it into this program, but it would have had to be a video, um, and so we wanted to to sing live this this uh, French tango instead. I should tell you that at uh, this moment, there are 28 additional messages in the queue here. So I don't know how far we're going to go. Um, my two cents, says Teddy Klaus, Deborah can sing the phone book, and it would be lovely. But Sondheim and Winter, that's heavenly. Jan Gordon comments, the minor key of the Sondheim and the melancholy. Deborah, it's gorgeous. Uh, bravas. Uh, Janelle uh, says, I was unprepared for evening primrose. <laughs> oh, Janelle. Uh, it's, yeah, I'm, I'm so glad that we were able to bring some Sondheim into this program. I'm um, skipping over oodles of bravos. Uh, Jack Hadley writes, thank you so much, Deborah and Josh, for an amazing program. Thank you to all who made this program possible. Uh, the applause continues here. Um, my goodness, I don't see a question. I think it's all the audience <laughs> on its feet. Um, let me read you a couple more. Nancy Raskin, we wish we had more Deborah. You and Josh gave us a beautiful concert. Kudos, Nancy Pines. This program was absolutely exquisite. Thank you, Deborah and Josh. Rona asks or says, so many Jewish Broadway composers other than Sondheim and Weil, which would you include as serious composers? For example, Gershwin. That was actually going to be my first answer, uh, was Gershwin. Uh, there was a Gershwin piece that we uh, thought about including uh, because he also has a Jewish background. Um, I, I, I would have considered really any of them serious composers. I don't, I, I would love to discuss what what makes a composer serious. Uh, I have many friends who compose very different music uh, than this these days for the Jewish community. Uh, some of them children's music artists, uh, which I, I don't know that it makes it less serious, uh, taking the craft seriously with not taking ourselves seriously uh, is, is one of the hallmarks of, I think, uh, a, a good piece of, of music that would last. Um, but I, I, I think that, that many composers, certainly if, if they're on Broadway, I would bet that they're pretty serious uh, about the works uh, in terms of the, the complex harmonies. Um, I think probably Gershwin rises uh, highest with, with Sondheim in that um, for what we would consider Broadway composers. Well, um, I'm about to ask you a question, but I have to tell you, I think you've just blown up our switchboard the number of mess messages is not going down, it is going up to 32. Uh, Harriet Weider, how do you choose the music for our services with so many possibilities? Well, actually that's from Jerry writing on Harriet's uh, uh, screen. Hi, Jerry. Um, so how do you do that? Um, it's a good question. Uh, Sometimes it feels like throwing a dart at a board, um, but often it is more about the, the arc of the service and the, the feel of the week. Um, and of course, we, we have a liturgy and a, a, an order of the service, 
um, that if we have decided we value the text mi chamocha, I'm choosing from among settings, musical settings of mi chamocha. Uh, so it would be at that point about where we just came from in the service, either musically or textually from one of the rabbi's introductions, where we're going, um, how it musically would tie into the next piece. Um, and then on top of that, it's, it's sometimes just a feeling of uh, what people might need or what I might need in that moment. Um, it is a, a secret that I'll, I'll share just in this group, which I know is being recorded, so anyone who's watching this later will also know this secret. Uh, sometimes if I am playing a service on my own that didn't need to be rehearsed with anyone else, uh, I might choose a melody on the spot um, based on how it feels in the room, uh, what direction we need to go musically. Uh, it, it, I, call it, it, I go rogue uh, sometimes in just choosing different melodies than, than what was on the paper. Um, and, and I find that, that is, that's a big part for me of what makes it prayer, is that it's co-creative with the, the people who are with me in the, in the space. Well, with as many as five rabbis on call here uh, normally, how do you collaborate and, and figure out, do you actually do a rehearsal, of a phone conference, or what? what's the technique? We have, uh, and I, I'm, I'm surprised that more synagogues don't have, but we have a weekly worship meeting uh, where even if you are not on that weekend uh, personally, uh, everyone attends this weekly worship meeting in planning gotcha. the next week's services. Um, we meet for an hour and we, we talk about the, um, the taste of, of the service and what's going on in the world um, in, in kind of making these choices together as a team, regardless of if we personally will be executing them. So I, I feel blessed to work in a team where the rabbis care about the music and the musicians care about the, the rabbinic texts. I think I'm probably speaking for more than myself when I say, I'd love to be a fly on the wall during one of those sessions. Uh, Teddy Klaus responds to Ginger Fromm's question. I would say with all due respect, it's not as simple as that. That is the minor aspect. Not to be too technical, but most Jewish music is actually modal, which is often heard by Western ears as minor. Yeah, that's. Uh, thank you, Teddy, for adding that. The, the Fragish... <laughs> A uh, line that Josh played on the piano is one of those modes, and actually the first piece, the barfu we sang, was in another mode, uh, Dorian mode, or at least that's how it was notated. Uh, so yeah. the, both of those would be heard to most ears as minor, and, and that is correct. Thank you for adding that. Beth Rubens, uh, Deborah, can you please list the program somewhere? I would like to explore some of this music myself. Thank you. Uh, sure, I would be happy to do that. Francie, why did Bernstein write a mass? Uh, uh, I don't know Bernstein's mass, um, but I, I know that many Jewish composers wrote uh, for the organizations that were hiring. Um, so I don't know if you know more about Bernstein's mass itself. Yeah, well, the, you know, the mass was the mass was written for the, the opening of the Kennedy Center here in cool. Washington, D.C. Um, I, I didn't write my dissertation on Bernstein's mass, but I know the piece, and it's very eclectic, as a lot of Bernstein's music is stylistically eclectic. Um, for, for my ear, Bernstein is composing a mass as a dramatic arc. Like that's, that's just the story that, that he was writing but he also throws a lot of other things into the mass. It has like a rock band and a marching band and there, there's been done with dancers and there are also some par down versions of it. Bernstein also wrote a shorter mass in, in Latin um, that's a little bit more, more traditional. But I think for his mass that was commissioned by the, for the opening of the Kennedy Center, he was thinking dramatically and kind of Growing, expanding the concept of what a mass is. Thank you. Um, I love that it was written for, for the Kennedy Center. Uh, and similarly to the question that we had earlier about singing Christian music, uh, some uh, also Jewish composers 
composed Jewish music, one of our most famous Christmas songs we hear on the radio in, in November and December was by Irving Berlin. Uh, so uh, that might answer the question, but I, I guess we would have to have asked Bernstein to know for sure. Well, here's uh, a comment from Nancy Pines. When I arrived at Georgetown University in the fall of 1975, several years after the opening of the Kennedy Center, we were told that he attended liturgies in Dahlgren Chapel at the university for inspiration. Interesting. Uh, Stuart Brown, no mention of the Ravel Kaddish? Not in this program. Uh, would, would have loved to, to get into Ravel, uh, but I, I'm not sure if you would have loved to get into Ravel. <laughs> I've played Ravel's Kaddish before, and it's an arrangement. I mean, it's the Kaddish, it's, it's yeah. the Kaddish melody, but with a kind of colorful uh, accompaniment, um, impressionist accompaniment on the piano. It's lovely, though. Ravel's not easy for pianists, so that's uh, great that you played that. It's pretty sparse. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's a great. sparser Ravel. Well, I hope I haven't skipped anything that I shouldn't have, but we actually have reached the end of the uh, list of questions, and I leave it to the leadership of this organization to carry on. Tell us where we go next. Right now, yeah. here, get me back in. Um, Harry and Karen, uh, why don't you figure out what we want to do? There's uh, well, probably not a Go. Go There's a, not a lot of time for a breakout room. What do you no, I think we should? Stand. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. David, there's not a lot of time for a breakout room. Um, what I'm, do you think? We should just how much time I, do you need for breakout? Huh? Well, breakout. We, we could, could do. We could do uh, ten minutes of a breakout. Oh. Yeah. The encore. Why don't you let them how sing an encore? Uh, Thank you. Uh, Thank you. And how about? I close and then we have Deborah sing something to yeah. to to end because it's just been such a joyful, incredible experience. Just a thought. Yes. If Deborah and Josh are up to that. What do you think? That would be wonderful. I agree, Harriet. Yeah. Okay. Deborah and Deborah? Josh, are you okay with that if I give my closing and we end with some music as we leave as long as you're okay with me sight reading that'll be okay <laughs> yeah okay. Great at sight reading. Um, i'm just gonna go run and make a copy uh while while we do our closing so that we both have it okay well um i want to thank you and josh we are so grateful for the joy of your music and your presentation today um, it was so interesting, and the chance to listen to you both and learn from you was exceptional. As we close before your ending, I want to thank Karen, David, Sid, Jerry, Barbara, Francie, and the whole Lunch and Learn Committee for all their faithful work, which keeps our program flourishing. Thanks to the Temple Mike office staff for their kind services particularly Jeanelle Disa and Sarah Brown. And on behalf of the Lunch and Learn Committee, thank you so much for being here with us today. And next month, we hope to see you on April 13th when Helene Granoff will talk about marvelous monarch butterflies. So um, Josh and uh, Deborah, if you wanna just end with some music, we I think that would be a nice way to Finish. Deborah's just photocopying the music for me. So. Okay. <laughs> okay. This is, my, this is my my sight reading audition for for you today. <laughs> okay. I could unmute everybody if if you guys just want to have a chaotic chat for a minute, <clears throat> or you can unmute yourselves, talk to each other. Well, yeah. Uh, we can we can unmute everybody just has many bravos and thank yous and um just it was it's such a nice diversion from the news of the day to be able to listen to beautiful music um, here josh is chichester psalms rendition maybe we can um figure out how to fund uh reduction in the orchestra part so that we can perform it at temple micah <laughs> hey, hey, amen. <laughs>
I think the um, the idea that a number of people have put forth about a concert would be just a great idea. I think somebody, if, you know, the powers that be could follow up on that would be just fabulous. We'll uh, we'll take some money from the pulpit line. The clergy won't mind. <laughs> <laughs> Barbara, Barbara, don't you already? Isn't there a harpist that we know? Or am I thinking of a bassist? Uh, I don't know a harpist, but it's I'm sure bassist, we can find sorry. one. We can find <laughs> one. Sure. Okay, are you guys ready, Deborah and Josh? Sure. Uh Nothing like putting you on the spot, but it's just a great way to end our uh, program and to begin our afternoon. So thank you yeah. again to both of you. Okay. Of course. I'm gonna go ahead and mute everybody. Can you hear us again? Confirming that everyone everybody can hear us again. and then you unmute yourselves and then we'll check. Back over to the unmute button. How is that? Now we can hear you. Okay, great. I'm sorry that I missed all the requests while I was in the office making the copy, but we mentioned Gershwin and it felt right. So uh, a little palate cleanser at the end of summertime. Thank you everyone. Thank you so 